one. I, uh, I've been in research since I finished my residency in 82. I run an fMRI lab. My son was uh, diagnosed with MS, uh, and that's how I got involved here. Uh, his uh, experience. It's part of the story, so I, I want to I tell you a little bit about it. In May, he had double vision and a right facial palsy. He was hospitalized for three days, saw three neurologists, had uh, the most traumatic spinal tap I had ever seen, all sorts of MR, and was given a diagnosis ADEM. Well, when I finished my residency in 82, that, that didn't exist. So I left thinking, wow, they've made a lot of progress in MS since I was involved. Uh, and then in uh, December, five months later, he had uh, a descending, uh, a, an ascending numbness, was reevaluated and was diagnosed with MS. So I decided it was time to catch up. Uh, so I went to the library and PubMed. My wife went to the internet, to Google. And uh, I want to just summarize. I'm just going to read these two quotes uh, word for word because it was really kind of shocking to me after 30 years to, to discover that this is the state of affairs. So this is the main textbook uh, for MS by, by Herndon. The possibility of it being a primary infectious process with or without an associated autoimmune reaction has not been entirely ruled out despite repeated failure to identify a causative agent. Over the last four decades, at least 14 different viruses have been isolated from the brains of MS patients yet none has been shown to be etiologically related. Cook listed 22 agents suspected of being related to MS for which substantial evidence of a causative role has thus far not appeared. Well, that was shocking to me. Neurologists are, have been telling patients all these years it's a cocktail of viruses, it's a number of viruses. But when you actually look at the papers, and the review papers in particular, that's not what the articles have said. The same thing is true on the autoimmune theory. So this, I'm going to read you this entire quote, too. Uh, uh, these significant data seem to have been ignored by some who are willing to defend the theory that MS is an autoimmune disease mediated by immunopathological mechanisms despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. Studies of these agents show that the inability to go beyond the 33% line raised the possibility the entire observed benefit is only a placebo effect. It could be argued that over the years the autoimmune hypothesis had been harmful to a considerable number of patients. Basic studies on speculative immunological mechanisms are continually shown to be unrewarding. It is clear that modern research should move away from the autoimmune theory. So this is where I got to in late December when my wife started talking about something else, uh, uh, the, the, the CCSVI theory. So I, uh, I run an fMRI lab. I want to explain a little bit what fMRI is because it, it turned out it has an application here and that's, that's what I'm talking about today. So uh, fMRI is MRI, only instead of one snapshot, you, you collect snapshots every two seconds. And uh, over that, uh, during that two seconds, uh, cognitive area, you, you activate the cortex with some kind of cognitive task. Uh, the, the, the cluster, the region of interest of neurons that are activated by that task uh, call in a surge of blood. Uh, that's called a hemodynamic response. That surge of blood uh, is uh, oxygenated hemoglobin, then deoxygenated hemoglobin. Deoxygenated hemoglobin is paramagnetic, so the MR scanner picks up that change going from the oxygenated to the deoxygenated, and you, you get a localized lesion. So this is what a typical fMRI uh, looks like. I particularly like this one because the, kind of the research that I was doing before that my son got uh, MS was in meditation. I was very interested in meditation. And so th this, this is a, this, most fMRI studies you will see are group studies because the brain's very noisy, the brain's never quiet. Uh, so this is a single subject. Uh, so you, it's an unusual slide because you hardly ever see the brain quiet, but that's kind of the fun of studying meditation. You're actually, what you're really studying is how do you make the brain really quiet? That's essentially what meditation is. So what you see here is deactivation in the rostrolateral prefrontal cortex, which is the attention area. So you see attention reducing, and then interestingly, you see activation in the insula. The insula is the part of the brain that receives uh, visceral information from the body. It's thought to be the area that's involved in empathy and compassion. So this is kind of a nice slide about meditation. When you're meditating, the whole brain goes quiet. 
your attention area deactivates and maybe even you have a sort of a, a, a positive uh, em empathic uh, experience while you're doing that. So I reasoned uh, that um, in, uh, uh, if this CCSVI theory is true, then possibly fMRI could be used to look at not the flow in the neck, but the actual flow in the cortex in the areas that are being activated. So uh, this is the, what's called the Buxton model, uh, the balloon model of how the hemodynamic response works. Uh, Buxton is uh, the, at UCSD uh, where uh, I trained with him. And basically, you get a characteristic response to an activation where you have a surge of blood coming in, um, in as that's being called in by the activation of the neurons that are going through whatever the task is, uh, a visual task, and a, a, a motor task, a cognitive executive task. You have a surge of blood that comes in, and then it, uh, during the length of the task, you have a plateau, and then you have a dro dropping back, but rather than dropping back to baseline, it drops back below baseline, and this is called the venous undershoot. So this is a characteristic that's known about fMRI, in general, it's looked at as a standard function, so it's not looked at specifically. So no one had looked at this uh, in any diseases of the, uh, of any neurodegenerative diseases, including MS. Uh, and, and the idea that Buxton came up with is that this venous undershoot is caused by a balloon effect, that blood comes in uh, and then it dilates the, the capacitance vessels, the capillaries and the venules uh, are a little bit dilated in a balloon effect. And then, and then the balloon, so the balloon dilates, the, 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 the cognitive cortical area dil, uh, balloons a little bit, and then it comes back to normal. And so that ballooning is what's causing the undershoot. So I, I reasoned that if in CCSVI there's a problem with drainage, then we'll not see a, a, an abnormal venous undershoot. So I came up with a task, tell time task, uh, uh, where what, what the subject does is here is the time of day, 2.20, sees two clocks. One's the right time and one's the wrong time. And with two button boxes, you, your, the instruction is to choose the wrong time. So you have an auditory task, so you can look at the auditory cortex. You have a visual task, so you can look at the visual cortex. You have a motor task, so you can look at the precentral gyrus. And you have an executive task, you have to inhibit the natural desire to choose the correct clock instead choose the wrong clock. It's a variation on a, on a pretty common cognitive task called the Stroop effect. Uh, and so this is the task that we started showing uh, to MS patients. Uh, uh, and now we have about 30 of them. I'm just going to give you uh, one, one example. This is an MS patient. This is a control patient. This is a pretty typical uh, pattern that you saw in that earlier slide. You have the, in, the, in, the surge of blood, the plateau, returning to normal, and a venous undershoot. And this is the MS patient where you have a, a steeper and, and higher uh, in, going to the top. No plateau. You hardly see any plateau at all. It's coming straight down. And then this is actually uh, twice as deep. And this is a fairly early study. In fact, this comes right back up to normal in the MS patients comes way back out. In fact, we have to go about 60 seconds out to see the other end of this. So this is uh, uh, patients versus normals. This, this is now what the actual scans looked like before and after angioplasty. So you don't really learn too much from this, but this is before and after angioplasty. This is literally the, the, the day after. So this is before the angioplasty, this is the day after angioplasty, and basically this is four different regions, prefrontal, so this is the uh, executive function area, precentral, this is the motor task area, parietal, and visual. In all four of these areas, you see a, an abnormal uh, venous undershoot, right? So this is actually looking at where you care about, right? We don't really care about obstructions in the jugular veins. We care about delay in the, in the cerebral cortex where we live. And so this is actually a, an objective look at poor venous drainage uh, in the cortex of four different areas. Sorry, 
you know, I'm just not going to do sham angioplasties in people. I, I realize it's going to have to happen, but I'm not doing it. No, I haven't. Uh, so, uh, was, that, was that a jugular angioplasty that was done in that patient? That patient was two jugulars and, and one asthma. Right. So, I don't know where this will go, but that, where I'm hoping this could go is a, a non invasive way. We can actually look at what we want to look at. Uh, the hope would be, and now we've collected data in about 30 patients, I hope we'll be publishing this maybe by February or, or March of next year. Uh, it would be nice to be able to say this person has venous delay or doesn't. Uh, that, that would be helpful information as to deciding what to do about a questionable. If somebody has no reflux and maybe just goes stagnant for a second, uh, maybe this will help us uh, make that call. Also when it comes down to the issue of restenosis, it might help us uh, solve, that, solve that question too. So this is just the beginning of this research. Uh, but I want to just bring up another subject. I'm not going to read this one or, or mention names, but uh, neurologists calling this a hoax, calling it Modern day quackery, restore some sanity, refute the tabloid science. This is not what neurologists were doing. When I was in training, we were the smartest guys. Uh, it's really bothering me that my community is, is, is being so negative about it, but the very least is an intriguing idea. So in summary, uh, as far as I can see, standard neurological thinking has just not been, not been proven. The viral theories and the autoimmune theories have not been proven. The drugs. Uh, my son is, takes ribis uh, every three days. He has a flu-like syndrome, vomits sometimes, nasty drugs, barely uh, proven to be efficacious. Uh, CCS5 is the most exciting thing happening in MS, and I think the neurology ought to be, ought to be embracing that. Where we got to go is how many of the, uh, so we, uh, so I do the Hickey protocol. Uh, after the, I went to the Hamilton meeting, uh, spent time with, uh, with Mark Hickey, learned his protocol. We have a Siemens 3T machine uh, so we can do the full SWI. So we follow uh, Mark's uh, protocol exactly. Uh, we get very upset if he sends, sends us a note saying we didn't do it quite right, because we had some aliasing on something. Uh, we, we do not do Doppler, but I do think that uh, I send the data to Hakey, so it's not, I don't tell them what the di diagnosis is. I try to send them normals as well as abnormals. Uh, and uh, so I trust that I'm getting the, the, the most sensitive test I can. But of course, the real question is, what's going to be the relationship between Doppler, uh, MR venography, and catheter? So that's, that's the first thing we're going to start seeing. I think we're going to want a, uh, a 10 or 15 percent uh, false positive rate. We want that with appendicitis, right? We don't want to be having every Every, uh, lap, lap, every surgery we do come back with an inflammation. We want to have some. So far, that has not happened. Uh, we've now done about uh, five or six cases. I do have an IRB, by the way. Uh, uh, we're going to have to see what that number is. What percent are not improving? So far, we've had one person who does not seem to be any better. Most of the patients do seem to say that their feet get warmer, fatigue goes away, the headache goes away, but there are certainly those who, who have had no change in their uh, their uh, ataxia or their uh, walking difficulty or their vision. We're just gonna, you hear some absolutely amazing stories out there. As I see it, there's probably been about 1,500 people who've had this procedure, different places around the world. We're going to have to have some kind of a registry, some kind of a way to put all this data together and, and look at it, but we don't know the answer to this. Uh, what's going to be the best way to deal with restenosis? Fortunately, so far, it looks as if it's pretty clear to the patients. They, they, they know what got better when they had the angioplasty, and they know when that symptom came back again. So I haven't found that to be confusing, but at some point it will be confusing. At some point we'll have, have to make the decisions about that. And then isn't it likely that all the, all the uh, stenoses are not going to be uh, only in the, um, in, the, in the easy places, at the bottom of the jugular? Isn't it possible we're going to see uh, narrowing in the straight sinus or the vena galen or the thalamus striates? Uh, this, this, this could get a lot more complicated, not just a lot more easy. Uh, after all, the pathology we care about is in the 
cortical ven white matter and cortical venules. That's the pathology we care about. And so it may not be that that's always going to be pathology that far distal. We, we're going to have to worry about it farther up. And so maybe there'll have to be other kinds of treatments, other kinds of uh, uh, endothelial-oriented uh, treatments. Uh, now, I, 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 I want to take a moment to finish this with, uh, with, with, with what the theory is. So uh, Paolo's theory, as I understand it, is that backflow is causing a uh, is, is, is damaging the endothelium, allowing RBCs and iron to break through the endothelium and to then incite an autoimmune phenomenon. Well, we already know there is no autoimmune attack on myelin directly. So why are the white cells, why are the, immune, uh, the, the, the cells going in and gobbling up, go, gobbling up iron? So even the new theory doesn't really quite explain that. So at least I entertain the possibility that the real problem is stagnation in the brain. It's not really a f uh, just a flow problem, but that stagnation, poor drainage of the swamp, is uh, making, is weakening the oligodendrocytes.